Yes. Okay. I have it here in my office. <laughs> I have it here in my Thank office. you. I'm very honored. And I'm, uh, you have created with so much passion this, um, this uh, exhibition, Pausa. It was very touching because when you reached out to us artists and uh, I was very touched because just the contact you made with us and put us together because we were torn apart as a community and you actually been bringing together this community um, over all the different borders, international borders into your space and into your heart. Um, you are, as I say, a force of love and a force of intelligence and beautiful. So, uh, and I'm very, very excited that I'm showing together with so many amazing artists. I love the uh, presentation you give on Instagram and on uh, various platforms. And I have seen a few shots from the gallery also, the space. And I love the fact that you didn't crowd the place because it actually amplifies the solitude that we all were in when we were creating it. Some of us are still in that, uh, or we are going to approach the next wave maybe of it, hopefully not. And uh, so this uh, project uh, sidewalk, uh, six feet apart, which is about two meters apart, uh, New York City, April to May 2020. And it's really in the spirit of Rainer Maria Rilke that each should stand guard over the solitude of the other. Right. And this sentence for me was the most important sentence of the project, um, apart of course from the fact that we are all guardians of people's hopes, or we are trying to be. This is the image for the project, um, and it's also, the entire project has about 32 images, but I'm not showing them all, you can see them also on my website. Um, I chose this one because it's, um, I think it's one of the most, well first it's the first image I took in the project. And I, I spoke to my friend Amy, Amy Good. She's like a Renaissance woman. She's an artist and she is a musician, a really cool rock chick as well as a farmer, an organic farmer and an educator. She works actually as the educational director at the drawing center, which is around the corner from where my studio is and where I live. And we're very good friends. Uh, we usually meet up short notice, for lunch or, you know, I, all the time. She's very close to me. And I, we were missing each other. So I was on the phone and I said, okay, why don't you come over and we just meet in the street. And then I called her again and I said, oh, wait, can you bring your guitar? Because I'm actually going to, apart from seeing you, you know, obviously with masks and, or bandanas at the time and six feet apart, but I want to, take pictures so that we're starting to create memories for ourselves. So the initial idea was that I was going to create memories for just me and the friends that mm -hmm. I photographed. This is not a curated uh, uh, ex uh, project. I, I basically photographed whoever was, had not fled the city. And well, of course, this all happened while uh, during lockdown, uh, when I when New York City was the epicenter of the pandemic from the whole world, and we were you know right in the middle of it, and the people who hadn't left the city, and who happened to be my friends or neighbors, I photographed. So if I didn't look at it as a casting, and I didn't photograph any strangers. And um, this is not a representation of New Yorkers or everybody I know. It's just people who were available. Cause, so, well, Amy, for example, is, of course, a wonderful woman. She, um, I looked at this later and I thought, you know, I live in America and you know what's going on there. Um, I was thinking when I look at the picture now that the way the guitar hangs over her shoulder is the equivalent of the sort of white supremacists who have their machine gun hanging over their shoulders. And I kind of phoned her and I said, Amy, you must look at this. I think 
this is what I read into this picture now. And we are doing it with love and with music, you know, and we stand very strong. Um, nothing is going to get us down. That was sort of the spirit that we needed to embrace because we were all, you know, a bit victimized in the situation. And so for most people that I photographed, it was actually their first time that they were either outdoors because of the lockdown or that they had a person to person encounter. And so these sidewalk visits, you know, they, they gave us a very, very deep sense of community because our community had been forced apart. And uh, so what I do for the, for the book, there's gonna be a book as well, by the way, which I didn't expect, but um, there's always going to be a, a space in between rather than one image after another because the space in between actually kind of gives the space that we had between each other. And also I only photographed one person a day because it was primarily a genuine meeting and reaching out to somebody rather than looking at it as an opportunistic photo project and where I had booked people, you know, um, one hour at a time. I didn't do that on purpose. And of course, also sometimes it would rain or people would have to cancel. Um, so these 32 images kind of represent about a month um, in the feeling of it. Um, so this is uh, Erica Baum, who is um, a neighbor across the street, and uh, she's also an artist. And uh, we used to always wait for each other at seven o'clock. Everybody would drop everything and we would hang out of our windows and bang pots and clapped and say hello to people. And honestly, I would stop anything. Five to seven, I, in the middle of a Zoom, I would say, sorry, I've got to go. And I would do that. And it was very meaningful for us, but also for our neighbors, you know, of course. And she was saying that we were the only people she saw every day because she looked across the street and saw us. Um, so that's, that's her. Um, this is not her dressing up. That's how she walked around when she did go outside. That was her shield. And uh, so that's, this is uh, Jill. And uh, she was showing me her sketchbook with her art. And it was uh, really a time, um, it was a time when I, I didn't see it as a sort of selfless project where I would facilitate. I, you see, I always wear the same dress and I did that after the first photo shoot. I decided to keep the same black dress on because I wanted it not to be about me. I wanted to be the projection for other people and the focus to be on the, it's a self-portrait with others, but I, it was really about the other people. So somebody asked me in an interview whether I staged these people. And I said, well, the camera was uh, across the street. The lens was just sort of fortunately right. So I didn't have to be in the street and be in danger to all the camera, even though there were hardly any cars. But what I did in the beginning, um, I asked everybody to stand up and raise their arms all the way up. Um, that's, uh, I don't know if you've seen Amy Cuddy. She is, um, she's, uh, there's a TED talk with her. What it does actually, if you raise up your arms, that's what people do when they win or something. It makes you, it gives you joy and happiness and a positive energy. And of course, by us already meeting, we were happy to, to see each other. But this gave, I, I just told them it was so that I could frame the photo. Um, but the, the really intention was to give people uh, a, a sense of happiness. Uh, there's actually something chemically happening in your body when you do that. You should try that. It's really good. Children also should do that. And, uh, but of course, it does help the framing too, because if you take a photo and somebody decides to put their hands up, you know, you don't want to cut off their arms, you know. And I had it on a self-timer with a multiple um, exposure. 
mode for nine images so that I didn't have to keep running over and I could actually really engage with people and didn't, you know, it wasn't just a picture at a time. In this case, I was visiting also, like the previous one, visiting Alex, who's a painter, uh, at his home because um, he couldn't really get to my place. It was very fluid, and um, I really felt that, I mean, there was not really a, a system apart from the fact that we would sit six feet apart, and um, I got a lot of joy out of these meetings as well because I realized afterwards that of course those were the only people I was seeing apart from my husband who's wonderful Patricia knows him he's absolutely amazing the, perf the perfect husband but uh, still you know we were not seeing other people apart from waving to them or maybe at night six o'clock we walk around if we could around um, Soho and there would be maybe one person per block or another couple and you know you wave to each other so we were very glad that we didn't leave the city also because by being so close you know to the actual situation and not escaping it and living in a bubble in somewhere in the countryside i think that we like you maybe probably did in mexico as well or in the cities where you lived you all lived um, you actually digest the situation of the pandemic much better because you confront it every day and you need to learn how to uh, adjust to it in your behavior. And of course also it's good to have a training how to communicate with others because um, we, we have to now, which we didn't think, we thought it was going to be three months and then it's all over and we're back to normal. But I think this is going to be with us for longer and we will have to adapt our behavior, our body language. We have to um, work more with our arms and hands and eyes, which other cultures are better at than my culture or background. So because if we cover it behind a mask and we are in distance apart, you know, we have to be more expressive and show love in a more intense way with it, with our bodies, you know. And I love Jakob, he's also an artist who lives around the corner. He was he's talking with his hands a lot. And um, so now this is Jill. When Jill arrived, I thought this is just amazing. The woman's just, she sat down and I chose I thought this was her best position to sit like that. And she reminded me of those photos from the Spanish flu um, in, what was it, like 18? Or you probably all know better. But uh, she looked just like one of those people from the last pandemic 100 years ago, you know. or So we, we just... So, she, yeah, she's a great woman. And... Um, you know, we after we took the pictures, we spoke for about one and a half hours sitting there until it was getting too cold. And, uh, the, you know, we had a lot of intimate conversations because also, remember, all of the people, including maybe you, if you live with your partner, you don't really have any private conversations with your friends because, you know, if you're on, even if you're on the phone, because they always, unless you live in a huge mansion, and, you know, but normally... You're in, you know, you can hear each other. So this privacy we had uh, between two friends was also very special. This is a very emotional story. This baby boy, he's a very, very close friend of ours who I've known for many, many years. He's a musician. I used to be a musician too, so I, that's why I have a few musicians in my project, uh, coincidentally, I guess, or not. And uh, what happened is that we, um, we arrived and um, I brought my chair. You see, it's always the same chair that I'm using. It's a handmade chair I found in a second-hand shop about two years ago. I have two of them. And if somebody didn't bring their own chair, I used to provide a disinfected second one. I love this chair. So what happened was that he sat down and he started playing. He actually composed a song for me. And he played it, and he looked across his guitar at me, and I started crying, like genuinely crying. And I was hiding, as you see, my face behind the hair. And it's a very, very emotional moment. Um, 
from me. I I talked to him not too long ago um, on, uh, and and I I told him that this was probably one of the most emotional moments from all the photos, and he said, oh, you know, this was the first time that him and his girlfriend had actually seen anybody. I had assumed they walk around, see friends in the street, and you know, but they hadn't. We were the first people that they actually seen, and so. I realize even these days sometimes that that you know it it does is it's a memory that we keep. So there we are, just sort of really relaxed with each other. Um, which is another thing you can be sometimes with friends. Just just hanging out in the same space is so so emotional and wonderful, you know. So reaching out without touching and holding each other in their thoughts without touching. This is Max. Max is a Max Black is a very quite well known poet and an old friend of mine. He only lives uh, a few minutes away, and he came and read a poem to me. Uh, he's got a Northern English accent. Adam, you would know how that sounds, <laughs> and obviously it's really um, enhancing the audio experience and that's his poem which he donated for this project and uh, this picture um, is from this was the second night in when after first it was very quiet where I live of course but then we had the the lootings the very violent lootings um, and so our place was all boarded up and somebody wrote on this, um, don't just be good. It's, he wrote, don't just be good, do good. And um, I thought that was very important. And James um, really wanted to be photographed in front of that. It was very important to him because a lot of people um, at the time sort of, you know, our, we look at the, the world now and we did look through sort of um, through the lens of our times, you know, the sort of COVID-19 lens. But then, of course, our current social political awareness was heightened by the recent events, you know, the murder of George Floyd and many others. And uh, he was saying that a lot of people say, well, I'm not a racist. But he said, it's not just thinking you're good you have to also do good you can't just be good and it, it gave me a lot to think about when he said that so this one was with my friend ruthie ruthie is from austria and ruthie and i were both performance artists in our past and um she was also a model but i wasn't but uh she's uh I said to her, let's just deal with the space between us. Let's try and negotiate the space between us. So we did a whole series of photos where we were basically working with that emptiness between us, the space in between. And uh, I, I saw afterwards, this is across the street from me, that the, the ad actually in the window is kind of mirroring her. I didn't realize that when we took the picture. Um, so that was quite important, and um, this is a very this was a very beautiful moment with Samantha. And yes, we were all locked into circumstances. You know, this whole time actually reminded me of the period right after nine eleven because we lived six hundred feet away from where the towers were crashing, and so. Um, I was numbed at the time, completely numbed. And I just found something, coincidentally, this is 19 years ago, and I just found something, um, because at that time, we, I took the images of the interiors, because the drama of what was one of the exterior, because the city was attacked, and therefore I pointed my lens into private spaces. And we were all afraid of our safety then, our own safety. But today I'm feeling more afraid for others. I'm sort of, 
I'm just I'm I'm carrying the pain of others with me because I think if I'm very careful I'd probably save myself, but I'm worried about others, which is also why we wear masks, you know. But I found this piece of paper. It, it's long. I just read one sentence to you, um, where I wrote about um, this project. Um, afterward, faces off Tribeca. I wrote, months later, we remember the feelings we shared then. Numbness cocooned us and anxiety shot adrenaline through our bodies with no valve for release. Emotions were trapped as if other forces had control over our minds and bodies. Since then, our spatial relationship has changed. And I thought that writing actually really is, again, current for today's situation. This is what I did at the time. I took pictures of the ocean and I just couldn't anymore because it seemed to be irrelevant to me. So what I did was I visited like a social worker, all my neighbours who were wit witnessing either people jumping from windows or, you know, the disasters. And they were survivors and they had survivor's guilt as well, but they were also very scared to go outside they were all inside all the time. This isn't my favorite picture. It's Richard Nonas, the artist, in his studio. And it's his home also. It looks like a cave, his home. It's amazing. So he invited me into his um, space as well. Um, and what I found is that what I was saying is that our spatial experience is, you know, we we have to find our bearings these days, our bearings because we are in a political and emotional landscape that we don't understand. And we have to adapt to that. And I think this is international problem. It's, I, it's not just uh, in one or the other country. I think we're all facing that in one way or other. And... Um, so it's, it reminds me of my parents who came back and in, in 45 from labor camps in Germany and they made their way to northern Germany. And when my sister and I grew up, I think my parents' sole aim was to make sure that we don't get lost in the actual landscape. They were teaching us where the moss of the tree is to find north, etc. But also the emotional landscape and the political landscape. So we only went hiking. We never went to luxury places or relaxed vacation. We, my father was continuously teaching us how to not to get lost. And if we weren't on vacation, then they would insist that we read newspapers. Um, on. So this reminds me, last year I had an exhibition. This is now the last project I'm showing you. Um, um, I had an exhibition at the Parish Art Museum and what um, I did was, um, it was with the project Mountain Interval, the book Mountain Interval had just come out, which um, is something that, um, Patricia, you're familiar with that. And uh, the, the exhibition was called The Space Between Memory and Expectation. Uh, which is actually also, um, at the same time, the title of uh, my book for next year and projects and exhibitions for next year. Luckily, I've taken all the photos already so that when the pandemic hit and, and we were in lockdown and I couldn't travel anymore, I actually have all the pictures and I was in the project of um, sequencing the images, you know. So what this project is about, um, I was, um, so these landscapes are sort of all very familiar to us and at the same time they appear abstract when presented in representation. And these are all large scale photographs from the Atlantic Ocean to the vast sand dunes in New Mexico and Colorado, Alaska, mountain ranges, Switzerland, Italy and Nepal. And they're all drawn together uh, across by one continuous, I don't know if my, can you see my hand there uh, going across, I don't know if it, but there's a continuous line going across. And I kind of felt that um, the sort of um, interval, the space in between um, is 
about moments where apparently nothing happens, but again, in those moments, we, we, change cannot happen without those main moments where nothing happens. There's a mathematical word for it, the space in between the past and the future, but it's a very boring, non-sexy word, so I forgot about it again. And so the space between memory and expectation is sort of a visual way to describe the state of stillness and transition. And this apparent still nature that we romanticize is actually an ever-changing and moving condition with the disappearance of permafrost, and which also is a cause for landslides. Entire glaciers disappear and will never return again. And of course, they also are um, not just pretty to look at, but they are our main source for drinking water and growing crops. So what I was trying to do is I was uh, creating an experience for the viewer upon entering the exhibition space that the viewer was feeling embraced by a continuous landscape. And actually, you know, most people who walked into the space, they actually said, where is this? And they were absolutely convinced uh -huh. that it was just one um, landscape, one and the same landscape. I mean, from high mountains to... Atlantic Ocean, which is, you know, of course, quite um, strange, but people did expect the, that it was one place, and that's exactly what I was trying to achieve, because um, I just think that by placing these contrasting visuals together, I kind of encourage the viewer to visually connect multiple experience and experience them as one sort of parallel realities from different locations, introducing conversations among different landscapes, environmental, political, social, of course, you know. So that's uh, actually in Alaska. That's the other side of the room. And you see on the right, there's, uh, there are three landscapes and they really kind of flow into each other but that's kind of coincidental in a way because they all, that's, you know, Himalaya, Langtang region, the Everest region, and the one on the right is actually in Alaska. And um, you actually don't understand the scale. When you're in front of them, you don't know really where are you in relationship to the space that you're looking at. So you enter a sort of non quantifiable space and disembody meant due to the loss of sense of scale, you sort of try and get an equation between you, uh, your body experience and what you're seeing, which means that you're really engaging with the image in a sort of more, you negotiate your own position um, and sort of from an abstract perception, you proceed and create a reality for yourself and make the absence into a presence. And then the abstract image seems to be listening to you and this is and you know and you feel touched by its non quantifiable space and i think it's a very inviting mountain they are not scary mountains they um terry salton the director she was saying that she thinks my mountains are reassuring rather than threatening which is very good in these um, times that we live in and yes these are these were all 12 archival pigment prints and uh, project you can see it if you want to look at it again on my website under um, where you find it but it's it's under um, um, an installation views I like to create room experiences for people because I come from a performance art background and um, I think it's very important to connect images, which is also what, of course, a good curator like Patricia does by m giving people an experience in a room rather than just a collection of images that, um, um, that they look at one by one, you know, because they all inform each other. And I created these combinations specifically for that room. And luckily I got really... Um, I could do what I wanted.